in this episode of the Critical Oxygen Podcast. I, I guarantee we both get into the laboratory, we would both be on different spectrums of how we utilize fats and carbohydrates through the course of, of the same test. Welcome to the Critical Oxygen Podcast, where we help you optimize your physiology and maximize your endurance potential. I'm your host, Phil Batterson. I have a PhD in molecular exercise physiology and am the founder of Critical Oxygen, where my mission is to build better endurance athletes through remote education and in-person physiological testing. Today, I'm joined by Coach Aaron Geyser from Endure IQ, where we talk about individualized nutrition for endurance athletes. Enjoy. Aaron Geyser, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, you continue to keep asking me back so it's, it's a good thing yeah man this is uh this is fun we've uh we've had a, a, a lot of growth and stuff like that on the podcast and you know i think it's just going to continue to to grow even further and i i really love how you know you're in my conversations and uh conversations that i've been having with dave shell lately really come down to how to individualize things uh for individuals um, because most of the time, right, when you read something in the media, whether that's, you know, Velo Press or Training Peaks posting something or, you know, whatever it is, we get this false sense that that's what we as an athlete should really be doing, or we as a coach should be giving to our athletes, as opposed to taking um, an individualized approach. And I know a lot of the times, right, when, when we talk about stuff, our answers are, it depends, but I think because podcasts are so open-ended and long form, answering it with it depends is actually good because then we can actually expand and extrapolate. And um, a perfect topic for that is nutrition. Um, I, I, think, I think nutrition is, the, is one of the biggest things that needs to be hyper-individualized. And because of things we see, tends to not be as individualized as, you know, really I would like it or you would like it. So if you wouldn't mind kind of starting with, um, you know, like I know Endure IQ's slogan is uh, right fuel, right time. Um, could you just give the the listeners kind of a little bit of a background of like how and why you guys came to that conclusion and that slogan and then how you use that to then start to recreate, you know, nutrition and, uh, you know, specific race day nutrition? So the right fuel, right time approach kind of came from well, one thing I'll say is we, we take a great deal of pride that we, we can work with athletes that are low carb, high carb. I think in the past, we've gotten really boxed into the thought that we were all low carb. That's how we would force you to race. That's not. And, and so from that, we kind of moved from that low carb, healthy fat lifestyle, even though we did race with carbohydrates, we, we decided to move more towards the right fuel, right time approach, because it, it, it more sculpted what we were coaching. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's more of utilizing nutrients for what we're trying to accomplish in those particular sessions. Right. So if we've talked about it a number of times, Phil, we, we do take a little bit of a lower carb approach in endurance work because what we're trying to do is drive fat oxidation. The reasoning behind this is the more on race day, the more fat we can pull as a form of energy, the more carbohydrates we're reserving for later in that race. Mm -hmm. Um, so we we feel like that right time right fuel approach is a right fuel right time um is basing what the athlete's going to be utilizing as their primary source of substrate and providing that substrate to the system to allow it to operate at its highest capacity mm -hmm. i will say too that i think there's a, a very common misconception that um you know, people who are on lower carbohydrate diets race low carb as well. 
um like like uh zach bitter is a good example of this he's an ultra runner i think he had like the 50 mile or 100 mile uh yeah. you know american record at some point amazing athlete and he went on to joe rogan and was talking about his training and what people walked away is that oh you know zach bitter's a low carb athlete and stuff but what they failed to uh, listen to on that podcast i'm pretty sure he mentioned this is that when he started getting into his race specific work and his um harder workout days and stuff he was absolutely fueling with carbohydrates it might not be to the extent that you know some people are feeling nowadays but he was fueling with carbohydrates and he was replenishing after hard workouts as well um so it wasn't like he was always low carb all the time when he was doing high intensity work which is where higher carbohydrate burn is actually coming into play he was refueling with carbohydrates so i i really like this approach that you know like the fuel that you're putting into your body or you're using should be reflective of the intensity that you're actually working at right um, correct like, it, yeah, like that, it makes sense because if you're not i mean there are some educational groups out there that are telling well iron man athletes should be taking in a thousand grams of carbohydrates per day well okay that's well if a, we can only absorb 90 grams per hour and that's very specific, like you have to be super specific on that because you can't just load up on 90 grams of one particular thing. You have to get it from glucose and fructose sources to get that maximal absorption. And when I hear that, I'm like, dude, that's that's 12 hours worth of feeding that you're doing. <laughs> like you're eating every hour for 12 hours to get that number. That, that to me just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's. It is interesting because like I and I, I I definitely think I think for the long like the longer races, the more important it is to really focus on, say, manually, uh, manually, manually manipulating your say fat oxidation and your carbohydrate oxidation to elicit the most amount of gains, because the longer the race, the more important maintaining your carbohydrate sources are for the extent of that race, right? Correct. You can get away with it a little bit more. Like you could probably be a little bit higher carbohydrate if you were, you know, doing like a 5k, a 10k and like racing, you know, for an amount of time that is not, you know, you're going to, you're going to be racing at a very high intensity. So you need those higher carbohydrate, that higher carbohydrate, but you want to spare carbohydrate as long as you possibly can with the longer the race that it actually is. And that's really interesting that some people are pushing like a thousand grams of carbohydrate per day. There was a study that I, I just posted on my Instagram. It was really interesting. It was published, I think in 2023. So last year, and what they did is they put, uh, they had, they had, I can't even remember how many people they had, but they had one group of people who were on a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, one group that was on a low glycemic index, um, you know, carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrate laden uh, diet, and then one that was on a high glycemic index carbohydrate diet. And what they found is that the low carbohydrate or the low glycemic index carbohydrate diet was actually um, in in a ten week study. So this isn't an extended period of time or anything like that. But it was the it was the best for maintaining fat oxidation and uh, well, high, high, a low carb, high fat diet was the best at maximal fat oxidation, you know, hands down bar none, your body adapts to whatever fuels you're putting into it, but you could maintain that fat oxidation ability by doing lower glycemic index carbohydrates for the majority of your, of your carbohydrates. And I think, you know, from a health perspective and from like, like a longevity perspective and stuff, that's probably where you want to be. Um, but then from a performance perspective, it's like, you want to have kind of like the, the back and forth. Because the low carb the the low carbohydrate high fat group had a really tough time with uh with peak, it was like their their maximal uh speed during a VO two max test was lower, and that makes sense because they're limiting their carbohydrates to a pretty good extent for ten weeks. But I I'm I would not... also I would also question if there was the detail of how much carbohydrate they were actually consuming because if they were absorbing carbohydrate they still should be able to have muscle glycogen at that point that should preserve for Some that peak. So I, I guess I, I, I think that those are good studies, but sometimes it's the, give me it's the, the additional site there just because that is because 
Dan's published some blogs on our Endurant IQ website, and it's it's there's a lot of information that he's come across that there's not as big of a separation in that because you still, if you're taking in 60 grams of carbohydrates per day or 100 grams of carbohydrates per day, you're still most likely absorbing that. And for an individual that's metabolically flexible, they're not utilizing a whole lot of that. It's only right. being used when it really truly needs. So if they go into that session, it's so I think, again, we're going down a rabbit hole that's super, super specific. And yeah. depending on, I, I guarantee we both get into the laboratory, we would both be on different spectrums of how we utilize fats and carbohydrates in the Absolutely. course of, of the same test. So yeah. I think that this is just one of those things where it's extremely individualized. And I think getting back to kind of the the topic of well, can i can i say one thing nope. real quick do your thing do your yeah. thing so so the you know so they they were looking at you know like fat oxidation lactate oxidation other things like that but over the course of 10 weeks all these individuals were doing the same endurance training program and guess which group had the best outcomes for performance i would say that it's probably it was pretty close between the low glycemic index and low carbohydrate group it I was think... it was exactly the same across all groups okay so yeah so it, it so at the end of the day it's like okay well we manipulated fat oxidation in the high fat group we manipulated carbohydrate oxidation in the high glycemic index group and within you know in, in 10 weeks obviously this isn't individualized because some individuals may respond differently and stuff but performance no no difference across the board so the exercise was really the most important thing to move performance forward that's that's what what i wanted to highlight with that because i just thought it was super interesting um but i do think again to go back you know the the first of all nutrition needs to be individualized based on you know how people are feeling and the longer the race, I think the more important dialing in that nutrition specifically for you is going to actually be because, it, you know, it, face it, you have a finite amount of carbohydrate within your body, you know, at any given time. And the longer you race, the, the, the higher risk of running out of that you are actually going to be. Um, and something you said to me, too, was that something you were noticing is that a lot of individuals who come to you guys, you know, they say, Hey, I, I need help with nutrition because every single time I race, I get stomach issues. I've DNF'd a bunch of races, other things like that. So is that, that was, I think Go ahead. it's kind of the both ways. I've had a lot of people come to me and new, they, they complain about those aspects, but they blame it on their training. They blame it on mm. everything else, but not the nutrition. I, I I see it more. More people are reluctant to change that piece of it than anything else that they do, hmm. and so it's the opposite of what you were what you were hearing in that case. I, I the thing that I would tell listeners is not be so reluctant to change your nutritional approach because there was a study within the, I think it was four years ago that took all the information from Ironman racing that interviewed individuals that did not complete the race. Mm -hmm. And what that meta-analysis provided was that the the number one reason why individuals did not complete their race was not from the training. It was not from the amount of hours that they spent a week. It was not from all these facts. It was, it was from nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I think so many athletes read what other athletes are doing or are told what their friends are doing and they try to mimic that and it's not right for them. And because it's working for somebody else, they are more reluctant to change that than anything else. And that's the one thing that I would try to promote to listeners is that if, if you are routinely racing, don't have the energy to finish, have GI distress, feel like you just, you can't keep anything down or you, 
you don't have the energy to produce the power or the pace that you had been training at. I mean, typically the number one reason or cause to this is that you've mismanaged your nutrient intake and we haven't found the right fuel to fuel your exercise for that day yet. And I, I just feel I get the impression that so many athletes hear what a pro is doing or read what they're being sent from a magazine or from uh, a mail order uh, nutrient group. And they, they just do it and blindly follow it, but don't test it. And these end up providing them with limitations or limiters on that day. And they'll look back. They won't blame that thing because they read it in a magazine. So they think that, or they heard an athlete say that they do it. Or, they don't or put it on that. Study, yeah, or one study showed that this was the, the optimal thing for these 24 athletes that did an ultra marathon or a trail race or something like that. Right. right. And they completely overlook that and they look directly at, well, it was my coach didn't do the job or it was the training that I did or I missed too many workouts. No, it really wasn't. It was probably, I mean, in most cases, it sits solely on the shoulder of the nutrition. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, that is really interesting because my the Ironman that I did, this is like so so, I did an Ironman during my undergrad for those of you who don't know, and had absolutely no idea, you know, like training wise. My, my the guy that got me into the Ironman printed off a, a binder with uh with the workout training plans that we were gonna do that was like not even customized or individualized or anything like that. Gave it to me, said this is what we're doing. I followed it to the best of my ability didn't eat enough, um, overtrained myself so much to the point where like when I would try to fall asleep, my heart would be beating so hard that it would keep me awake, which I've since learned is a sign of, uh, greatly, uh, under eating calories. Um, and then on race day, what happened is I was like, Oh, I'm going to eat, uh, I'm going to drink a Gatorade and eat a banana and eat a goo at every aid station on the bike. And it was fine until a hundred miles into the into the bike i felt if there was one more hill i was going to not be able to get up it and then during the run it was like you know i'd, I'd run to an aid station walk the aid station continue running felt pretty good got to about 10 12 miles into it and cramped from my shoulder to <laughs> my you know all the way down everything, no matter what I tried to eat, anything like that. And I can guarantee you now looking back at it with everything that I've learned, I was over consuming, you know, like carbohydrates and doing stuff that I had never done during practice or anything like that. Um, so, <laughs> so that's, that's my experience with it. And then to follow that up, I did an ultra marathon in May and as opposed to, you know, doing the thing where, oh, I'm just going to kind of, you know, train and do my thing. And then on race day, I'll just, you know, f fuel all willy nilly. I was like, okay, I'm going to work my carbohydrate intake up because at the time I had heard, you know, like 90 to 120 grams of carbohydrate is most likely going to be the best option. So I worked my, like when I first started training with carbohydrates and stuff, 60 grams of carbohydrate was completely adequate before I would start getting stomach aches or like other things like that. So, so first and foremost, that was an indicator to me that like, I just couldn't absorb the, the carbohydrates, even at 60 grams per hour, I was able to kind of get that up to, I think about a hundred and I do four or five hour workouts where I was taking in about a hundred grams of carbohydrate and I wouldn't have stomach issues or anything like that, which is, which is awesome. I'm not saying that's like the best way to go about it. But then when I got to my race, um, I tried to uh, like, I, I think what I did is I did the same flavor too long and then exerted myself a little bit too hard because there was that combination and then felt off the last half of the race. So again, it's like, I know this stuff and I know this, I should have just focused on exactly what I had been doing and all of that. Don't go too hard. You know, ego got in the way, went too hard, yeah, other things like that. So I've experienced this, you know, sort of sort of issue myself. Aaron, if I was coming to you 
And I had, you know, I, I told you about like, you know, my, my Iron Man, for example, what, what would your steps be to try to, you know, rectify that? So if we are just approaching race day, which I typically do, that's the focus. Then I start when we get into the week of the race, then we start to add in certain things to make sure that we're topping off our glycogen stores. But I don't call it carb loading because most people will sit down multiple bowls of pasta at one time, take in like 400 grams of carbohydrates at one time and end up gaining six pounds because they just store it mostly as fat. But um, focusing solely on the actual race, we, we, one, Phil, we need to have time to test the practice. So I'm never going to say, okay, well, we're going to do this by like, I'm going to just make this up for you and we're going to just go and use it for race day and expect it to work out. I mean, that talk about crossing your fingers and hoping that's yeah, all that would be. So the, the motto is nothing new on race day, right? That's, that's correct. Nothing new on race day ever. Well, and the other thing is you've put a lot as an athlete, you've put a lot of time and effort into this event and mm-hmm. I would much, I mean, we want to go in with as much realistic understanding of how we're going to do. And if we follow that plan, we're going to have a pretty good idea of what we're capable of. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when that comes off is when we have too many unknowns or we go outside of our parameters or guardrails in that case. So here I I want a good amount of time, especially if we don't have something that works. I I like to start this process about eight to nine weeks outside of the event. Yep. And I traditionally start low and move high. Yep. I so like that. what I want to do is, tri- I mean, typically when people have complications with this, it's because they are over consuming. It's not because they are under consuming. What, and even when we talk about the absorption rates being 60 grams of glucose and 30 grams of fructose per hour, there are other caveats that go with that fructose. I mean, it has shown to suppress fat oxidation. It is also shown at larger amounts that it does not have the same gastric emptying. So that means it's not moving through the gut. Therefore, if it's stalling in the gut and you're continuing to take on other substrate, you end up having that jostling feeling or just you end up starting to create um, irritation within the wall of the GI that ends up causing you to feel sick and have GI distress as well. Mm -hmm. So I go from, all right, we're, we're going to start low 40, 50 grams per hour. We're going to see how you tolerate it. Mm -hmm. And And this would be where in training would this be? Would this be like during race specific? We would want to have it on race specific. I'm not going to do this on an endurance ride because the, the two outputs are so completely different that I I don't, I mean, there's no point. So it needs to be more race specific. And typically I I will have a athlete wait 30 to 45 minutes before they implement some form of nutrition at that point to kind of give us that thought process. Okay. We're out of the water, even though we were riding the bike Mm -hmm. in the first place, give them that little bit of time and then start to implement, uh, carbohydrates at that point. And then we're just taking in, you're not going to be taking in carbohydrates during the swim. You might have a little bit of something before you get into the water, but, and I don't even recommend that often. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you, are you worried that like, you know, after, after a night of sleep, there's been a tendency to show decreased liver glycogen levels. Um, so if you don't eat anything, then you could be depleting your liver glycogen a little bit faster. When, than when I say that, I'm not saying don't eat anything. I just have a lot of people that will eat like a, thing of applesauce or a gel before they get in the water. That's what I mean. No, we're not doing okay. that. Okay. But on a race morning, yes, I- I'm recommending there's a lot of different breakfasts that, that we trial. And that's part of that process that we're also going to do. But first I want to see kind of 
I want a medium or smaller breakfast on those days and then start to implement carbohydrates to see how you feel within the workout itself. Yeah. So when it comes to race day, yes. So that's the next phase is we're more or less testing the breakfast on top of the race day nutrition that we've started to really start to hone in on, mm -hmm. combine the two of those and then see how we are coming out of those particular brick sessions on Saturdays to, to feel how energy is, feel how the level of, of just how holding power feels, all these things we're trying to match up and, and feel comfortable. So with this, I got to get these things off my ear a little bit. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> we, uh, so what I'm trying to do is provide a realistic simulation that's going to start to shape and up how you feel. Because ultimately, I'm asking all types of questions after that session. How did we feel? How was the energy? And, and I want open conversation here because this is going to ultimately shape the next trial because mm -hmm. legitimately we're not going to get it right on the first time. It's just the percentages are just not there. So mm -hmm. I really want to have enough information of how you felt. And what I'm looking at is a repeat feeling multiple weeks. And typically if I have enough time, I want to see it three, but at least if we see it two, we're going to have a hot, heck of a lot more confidence in that practice. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I, I traditionally start with 40 to 50 and then start to implement up. Now, again, I'm also making these recommendations based on what I'm seeing as the output for the particular athlete. Mm -hmm. If I'm coming up with an athlete that's putting out four watts per kilo, yeah, we're probably coming out of the gates at six, uh, 60 grams and then moving up the ladder from there. I'm not yeah. going to just because the whole thermodynamic aspect and power output needed for that individual that's putting out four watts or 4.2 watts per kilo compared to somebody that's going to be racing at 2.4 is just completely different. The person yeah. that's at 2.4 probably does only need about 40 grams of carbohydrates per hour and should be fine to just roll through that mm -hmm. because there's just not that same amount of need to generate the force and manage the system nutritionally yeah. to pump blood, to control the body temperature, to put out the watts, to, to yeah. put out the pace. There's just not enough. So of course I am looking at a little bit more detail to make that first recommendation for athletes and it's typically based on what I see as their output potential being is going to be where I kind of start that number. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I think, you know, first and foremost, it's a, it's a calorie game, right? You know, you're, you're really high output, you know, uh, you know, Sam Longs and, and other, other people like that who are really good on the bike, they're going to be outputting what, four, are they at 400 Watts for the entirety of like the, the bike? Not the entire, I mean, but there are big stretches that they're going to put out where it is. And I mean, depending on 70.3 to race pace, it's going to, or 70.3 to full distance Ironman pace, that's going to probably change between, depending on the person, anywhere from 20 to 40, maybe even 60 watts, depending yeah. on the individual. Um, but that's a there's lot. again, My, the bottom line is, is that's a lot of energy output, right? Yeah. You know, like if you're yeah. doing, if you're doing 350 to 400 watts for four hours, like that's, that's a lot. And it's, it's tough to like, whenever you're exercising, you're essentially going to be in a calorie deficit. There's, there's no way of actually replenishing unless you're going really, really, really easy. Um, or if you're a really small individual with, with pretty low, you know, like, uh, power to weight ratio. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so that's why, so that's why it makes sense to start individuals with lower kind of watts per kilogram, um, in terms of carbohydrate consumption versus a little bit higher for those with, uh, with higher power outputs. No, that actually, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, it's, so then what we're doing is one, we're trying to find the right carbohydrate. And I traditionally, I've, the last couple of years, I've really become in love with the, uh, highly brand cyclic dextrin. It's just, it's, it's expensive carbohydrate. I think compared to glucose, glucose is about 13 cents per, uh, 
per ounce where this stuff is a dollar 13 per per ounce oh, so it's, it's a significant amount but the testing has shown that it just has a high um gastric emptying rate absorption rate and it does not have um it does not create instability blood glucose levels so this i really especially on the bike it's something that i really like to push because it's important early in that race that we are absorbing as much as we possibly can. And if we start to consume a whole heck of a lot of sugar early in that race, sometimes you're, you're in good shape for when your body is not moving. You're on a stationary, like the bike is moving, but the, you are sitting on a stationary piece of mm -hmm. equipment. You're just causing it to move your body's not kind of going through some of the jostling and some of the movement. So you're able to kind of feel good, even if you're taking in too much sugar, or too much carbohydrate. But when you start to run, everything starts to move in a different way. And you're like, oh my gosh, this feels mm -hmm. awful. How am I supposed to do this for 13.1 or 26.2 miles? Mm -hmm. So I, I look for highly branched cyclic dextrin early in just because it's going to be a more highly absorbed. Therefore, you're going to be able to utilize what you're consuming and you're going to be able to hopefully hang on to that endogenous carbohydrate or what you have loaded up through the previous week and allow that not to get used until you get to the run. And then the run, I traditionally back down to a lower amount of carbohydrates just because again, we don't want to cause that interruption in the GI. And if we've mm -hmm. done, if we've absorbed a grand amount of carbohydrate on the bike and prevented that utilization of that glycogen, we're going to be able to have enough energy on board to provide the timeline that we're going to be out on the course while still taking carbohydrate through the run. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like that approach. And I was going to ask you about, you know, the, the difference between like bike intake versus run intake. And you answered that question. Um, something that I found too. So, so, you know, studies, uh, are like continually coming out where they're looking at, you know, different ratios of glucose to fructose and other things like that. And I think, um, you know, kind of the quote unquote magic ratio at this point is, uh, one gram of glucose to half a gram of fructose is kind of like the you know, what most people can absorb. However, there was another study that came out that was like one gram of glucose to like 0.8 grams of fructose was actually, you know, more advantageous. Um, and I fell into the marketing, you know, behind it because I was given, you know, some, some, uh, nutritional supplements that claim to do like one to one or one to 0 0.8. And, you know, and, and the idea is, is that because, you're pushing higher fructose, you can absorb more. That's the idea. But in practice, it absolutely did not work for me. And this is probably because like, I, I typically work with, uh, you know, something that's like more maltodextrin, mm -hmm. um, and, and then like fructose added. So it's, it's the one to 0 0.5 ratio that, you know, is generally more well tolerated. I took this, this one that I think it was 60 grams of carbohydrate. And 60 grams of carbohydrates, nothing for me. Like I, I, I never have issues with that. I don't have issues up to about up to even 90. Um, I haven't, I haven't had to push it lately just cause I haven't been training for anything big or anything like that. But, um, I, I took this one and it was 60 grams of carbohydrate and it was almost immediately got a stomach ache. Like, and I, and I don't know if I was like, you know, like, like wanting it to happen, but immediately stomach ache. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm never eating that again. Cause it was like, it was too sweet. It was just like, like the flavor wasn't great. My stomach started to hurt and immediately I was like, nope. Um, so the, the bottom line here is that just because a study says it's optimal for, uh, absorption or something like that does not, does not mean it's actually going to work for you. Um, it doesn't mean that I couldn't have worked up to it, but if something is immediately making my stomach hurt and I can tolerate other things a little bit better. I am more apt to go with the thing that I know I can already tolerate versus the thing that, you know, uh, hurts my stomach. So this is, um, this is kind of a PSA to say, try different nutritional supplements while you're training as well, because, um, you, maybe you can't get your hand on the, uh, you know, the highly cyclic, uh, dextrin like Aaron's talking about, but you can get your hands on probably five or 10 different carbohydrate 
carbohydrate supplements that are all going to be slightly different flavors, have slightly different mixtures of types of, you know, glucose and fructose. And it's, it's important to know what works with your body and what doesn't work with your body because it's like salt is mixed in there, you know, quite a bit, your electrolytes, right? And that could also affect absorption of those carbohydrates as well. So you have to figure out what actually works for you and the flavor that you can tolerate because flavor is a big thing too. Like if you're overdoing it on something that is super, super flavorful from the get go, I can guarantee you by the time you're done with, you know, a 10 hour race or a 12 hour race or even longer, uh, you're going to hate that flavor and never going to want to eat it again. Um, Cause that's also happened to me. <laughs> well, and I think a lot, the, kind of the hot topic now for a lot of nutritional companies is go into flavorless. Yeah. The other thing that I'll say to this is just because it's on a race course does not mean it's good for you. Yes. Yeah. It does not mean it's going to work for you either. Right. Right. Hey, so I, I always enjoy sometimes you have that, you mean that's not good? For, no, it's terrible. I mean, I understand that most of the stuff is chemically made anyway. So, mm. but it's it's testing out. And I like to again, I'm a simplistic individual. I don't like a whole bunch of stuff in there. And when the ingredients list starts to grow, just like it is for Whole Foods, I, I try to stay fairly close to smaller amounts of ingredients. And I do recognize. Most of these race products are going to be somewhat developed in a, in a, in a white lab coat, but I feel like when you have six or seven different things mixed up into one, you just start to flirt with more options or more possibilities of having some form of negative reaction to it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you don't, you can't really pinpoint, you know, what is actually causing the issue, right? The longer the ingredients list, the the lower the the smaller the ingredients list, the easier it will be for you to like kind of pinpoint what's going on. Absolutely. Um, and it was interesting. I was I I I frequent the um like triathlon and Ironman subreddits and stuff and somebody was asking about, you know, like carbohydrate consumption and there is there was somebody who was like, "Yep, I just mix up uh, you know, table sugar which is sucrose, which means that I think it's glucose and fructose. Uh, it's got a glucose to fructose ratio, okay. but it's a little bit. So it's, so it's uh, one glucose to one fructose, which would be, yeah. you know, like the, 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 uh, the ratio, which would be the one that messed my stomach up. But there was somebody who was just like, yeah, I just mix, uh, you know, a bunch of table sugar with a little bit of, you know, like, like, like salt or something like that. And then that's what they intake for, you know, their four hour bike rides or their five hour bike rides or their Ironman stuff. And I was just like, Hey, that's probably He's, the cheapest option. That individual might be part hummingbird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Look for a long tongue. <laughs> and they're, they're <laughs> yeah. Um, because that, you know, that's just going to be, you know, like simple syrup, essentially. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that they might not be, they might be able to tolerate that super, super well. So I, I, you know, all joking aside, they probably came to the conclusion, yeah, this is going to be the most cost effective, the thing that's going to help my stomach and all that sort of stuff the most. And it seems to work for me. So more power to you probably wouldn't work for me. Um, but I mean, that's essentially what a lot of these, uh, a lot of these nutrient, like, you know, these carbohydrate supplements really are, you know, if we, if we kind of cut, cut through it and, you know, cut through like, kind of like the BS marketing where it's like, well, this one's packaged with a little bit of, you know, uh, gelatin. So it actually, you know, changes the amount of absorption and other things like that. Um, you're like, well, maybe. And yes, I have tried Morton, which is, which is the one I am referring to. Um, and it was fine. It, it, it worked really well for me. Um, but yeah, it wasn't like, you know, game changing or anything like that. Well, and I different strokes for different folks. And I think yeah. that it, but it's still, I, I of course have products that I lean towards and start with, and I will continue to lean and start with those particular brands because one, I've seen them work across the board. Mm -hmm. and two, I do feel like they're a good starting point, and it gives me a heck of a lot more information on where to go from that point. And yeah. I, I, uh, 
I, I'm I'm pretty loud about I'm not a big fan of especially on the bike. I don't like to throw in a lot of fructose or a lot of sugar. I think there is a little bit more flexibility to add that when you get into the run, just because you're trying to turn over energy just a little. I mean, you're trying to finish, but you're also going to have the the timeline of creating GI distress has shortened at that point. So you are less likely to, I just feel like if you throw it on during the bike and then throw it on, on the run, you're more likely going to have some type of issue. But if we throw it on, on that middle to back portion of the run, it's just a lot less exposure to the system and it's going to operate in just a little bit more of a productive way. Do you, do you classify maltodextrin? as sugar as well or no you... it's it's okay. actually in its form it's shown as a glucose so it it, it shows on that opposite side where you are going to get more from or closer to that 60 gram absorption rate from maltodextrin than yeah. if you were doing something like straight fructose or sugar okay and uh, yeah because because i think i think people do get confused because you know if we think of table sugar for example right that is dextrose um yeah. you know so so sugar is 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 a little bit of maybe an ambiguous term so i just wanted to, i just wanted to clarify but you know like in so yeah cuz cuz that's what i found is that uh, i use i've been using never second just because i tried them during uh you know iron man kona and it actually worked really well for me um but I, I, you, do you use, uh, S feels? Is that, is that more your go-to? That is one. I, I also kind of combine that with, uh, I, I mean, there's other nutritional groups that I, I, here's the thing. I am trying, my athletes are, the goal is to have them race as fast as they possibly can. Yes. Get better and, and do things. But when they, when they tow a race line, it's about them going as fast as they possibly can. And I try a lot of different things for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are a couple that I do not cross the line and take. There's been a couple of athletes that have come to me with one particular brand and look, that's the first thing we're dropping in the trash. We're getting away from that <laughs> stuff. It's terrible. Right. Right. Um, but I, I still, there's other things that I am, putting into the system because I want to make sure I, when, when the athlete's going to be taking that, I want to kind of understand the texture. I want to understand the feel. I want to understand things about it. Yeah. When it comes to me racing, I am very specific. There are certain things that I'm taking and there's other that I'm not, mm -hmm. but during the testing process, I like to know what athletes are. And if, if an athlete comes to me and says, Hey, I like, I'm, I'm, currently racing on this and they've not had any issues nutritionally in the past, I'll give it a try. Cause I just want to know. So when we are developing a race plan from a nutritional standpoint, I recognize and, and know how it works. Yep. But I mean, yes, for me personally, when I'm stepping on a race line, it's, it's S fuels and there are others that I will consume at certain points, but that's the primary one that I'm consuming. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, this is just, uh, I, I just wanted to give people examples of things that have worked for both of us because, uh, you know, there's so, there's so many out there now. Um, but I think at the end of the Precision day, like, nutrition is one that I like to recommend. Yeah. I mean, there is a carb powder that is highly brand cyclic dextrin or cluster dextrin as they've, uh, that's from transparent labs, mm -hmm. um, that I, have tested there is i mean you got shot blocks i would typically not recommend individuals eating is, is that goo or, is that from goo or that's is that cliff a different... cliff okay cliff. yep goo is not one that is on my recommendation there's another one again i don't feel like i'm not gonna get hate mail so i'm not gonna say that particular brand but there's one like it's legitimate I'm not touching it and it, yep. it's more of a drink form so you, it's, it's not Morton, but it's something that I just don't like. Yeah. It's, it, it is interesting too, because uh, like uh, the bottom line is I recommend trying some of these and, and, you know, seeing what works for you and then seeing what 
what dose works for you as well. You know, kind of approach it exactly what Aaron was talking about, right? You know, it's like start at, you know, 40, 50 grams per hour. See how that goes. How'd you feel? Did you, did you, did you feel bad at the end because you, you know, like you overdid it? Um, did you feel good at the end? If you feel good for two or three, you know, sessions in a row, then maybe you can bump it up 10 grams per hour. See how that works. Because there also is some level of adaptability to the gut and your ability to uptake uh, carbohydrates and different, um, different distributions See, once of carbohydrates I, too. I'm more, once I find the number, I stick with it. I don't mess with it. Okay. I'm not trying try, to, I mean, you don't try to push it higher. Why? To me, it's why. Yeah. Because if, if we are showing the response that we want, why do we want to? Because that's what's going to end up throwing you off. Because then we're all, because also in that nature, for you to get the full fundamental like feel, you're now going to have to do a full 112 mile bike ride, or you're going to have to do a 56 mile bike ride and then right. go and run 26 miles or run 13 miles. We're not going to do that. Right. So I I don't feel like if you feel like your energy is sustained, we're in a good point. That's where I don't think the point is continuing to push, continuing to push because one, what's, what's the, what's the benefit from that? Right. Right. I mean, no, that's actually, that's a very good point. And I think the way that I've always thought about, right. Is like, well, you can, you know, kind of like you can adapt to, you know, eating higher fats to have more maximal fat oxidation, you could, you can adapt to absorbing more carbohydrates, um, which in turn would potentially give you better performance. But at the same time, it might just be an argument of hyper optimization where it's like, you know, if you found a number that is adequate for you, and that is allowing you to maintain your energy over the course of an entire race, then why do you need to push it even higher? Right. Like, no, I think I, I, that's a, that is something I had never thought about. And I don't think a lot of people actually think about that is like, you know, what, it, what is actually optimal and do I need to keep pushing it farther and farther and farther? Or can I just stay here, stay in my green zone? And then as I practice taking in 70 grams of carbohydrate per hour during my race specific sessions, your body will actually probably get better at just absorbing those 70 grams. So then you run actually lower risk of developing, you know, gastrointestinal issues and other things like that. So, and again, no, there, there's, me, there's nothing that really, so this is where testing absorption rates gets very, very difficult. I mean, it's, it's an intrusive, like you can't just do something easy to find out what it is. Right. So by your, earlier comment by just continuing to move that needle up we we don't know no we don't and, and again we don't know if that's the outcome and more or less what we're basing why i'm basing my judgment off of not doing it is i've seen too many people try to take that approach and they end up running into that brick wall on race day because hey it was fine when i was doing a four hour bike and a you know, run off the bike of eight kilometers. Well, that's not anywhere close to what you were actually coming to do today. Right. So I, I just, I, I guess that's where my, I'm pretty hard fast on this, where I, I if we find the right number, we're sticking with it. The, what, what's the point yeah. to me? I don't gather the information of why it's more important to push that number up because all I get is, end result is that you've pushed up your tolerance to be able to handle more, but it doesn't mean that you're absorbing it. And again, if you have, let's say that you are tolerating it, but it's still not moving through your gut, there's still long-term potentials that are on the other side of that rainbow. And we have plenty of, I mean, there, there's, athletes out there right now that are pumping how many grams of carbohydrates that they're putting or that they're putting into their system. Well, two of those we know are getting off the course in under seven hours and 45 minutes. Yeah. There, there are others that have not been able to translate over to really having excellent races at the Ironman distance of having 120 to 150 grams of carbohydrates. So they haven't proven it. So only, only 
there's about two or three people that have shown that they can consume that amount and not have any ill effect. For other individuals that have gone under that seven hour barrier, they just don't have as much, they're not as vocal or not as transparent, I should say, of what they're consuming. So I don't think we necessarily know what their intake is per hour. So I can't make a judgment on them. But the the two that are the most vocal are the only two that have really shown that they can consume 140 to 150 grams and it not can create all types of issues. Yeah. So understand when athletes are that are listening to this are looking at the greater like picture, two out of everybody is not <laughs> a very good percentage. <laughs> So don't think that that fits you. And I'm being completely serious that just because there are outliers and we have outliers uh, in every aspect of life, but these are the two that we look at. Mm -hmm. That's a small sample. I mean, that's a small percentage of success, isn't it, Phil? Yeah. Oh yeah. And that's not enough for me to test that. No, I, 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 I think, you know, like, like from, you know, even, even if the research isn't, uh, you know, like a hundred percent stand, like doesn't a hundred percent stand up to, you know, perfect scrutiny and stuff. I would say even at a maximum, I wouldn't even recommend anybody going over 120 grams. And even from that perspective and from the things you've shared with me, 90 grams seems to be kind of like that, that maximal, uh, you know, sort of amount that we can actually take in. And, and now after this discussion, right, I'm, I'm actually more apt to say, okay, well, ask the person why, or ask yourself, why do you want to try to push your carbohydrate oxidation even higher? Like, what's the purpose of it? Um, and if, if you want to just give it a shot and just see, by all means, go ahead and do it. See if you're an outlier, but also know that, you know, it's like, you probably could have a a better outcome, a more consistent outcome if you backed that off. And and that I 100% agree with. And I, I know we talked about testing and testing protocols a couple of weeks back. Mm-hmm. And that does, again, recognize that, one, knowing what your substrate utilization is at those race pace efforts allows you to get a more precise intake of what you're going to need because mm-hmm. – if you're burning this, you need to probably replenish it with that, but it still needs to fall under those kind of general absorption rates. Because again, you're not going to be able to test this other than doing it that distance and consuming that amount of, of nutrition through that process. But knowing what you are utilizing is extremely important because it's going to allow you to know, okay, well, because what I I sent over some information on you where I was doing, what was it? 280 or 270 or I think it was 280, 285. Something like, I I thought you were like bumping it up, but you went from like 240 to 280. No, that was the next step, but I I did three segments of 280 and then i did do the 290 and for some reason the numbers started to come back wonky but always fun um what we found out was i I was roughly about what i don't have the numbers up but i think it was about 50 carbohydrates per hour at that particular output for me yeah i don't even remember i don't even remember that because i was just too focused on how many, how much fat you were burning, which is incredible. But, but yeah. And you know, so, so if it's 50 grams per hour for you, you know, that's coming from, and you have to remember if you're, if we're measuring whole body carbohydrate oxidation, that's coming from both what you've been intaking, which I I take it at that point, did you not intake much during that workout? So that's all coming from endogenous carbohydrates. So either liver glycogen that's going into the blood or muscle glycogen that's already there. Um, So at a maximum, right, if, if Aaron was to intake 50 grams of carbohydrate per hour and absorb all of that, then he could, he could essentially, and this isn't actually how it works, but he could replace the 50 grams of carbohydrate that he's oxidizing from his liver and from his uh, muscle glycogen and replace that with what he's actually intaking. Like I said, that's not exactly what it, what it actually means. So in all actuality, 30, 40 grams of carbohydrate intake would probably be 
you know, like a, a really good target for him on that day, given what we, we found out, you know, with the, with that actual test. And having that information just allows you to get more specific, but yep. my response to you and your earlier comment was why the hell would I want to take a hundred grams of carbohydrates or whatever, like build up to that point. If right now I'm efficient and able to like, yeah. okay, let's work it up to like, let me, I take 66 per hour. It's probably plenty, you know I mean? Yeah. It's just why push that number up? Yeah. It gives you a, a, by being a little bit higher, I think it gives you a little bit of wiggle room in terms of, you know, like if you wanted, if you were feeling good and went a little bit harder in a few places and you know, like other things like that. But like, again, it's, it's, it's just giving you a buffer, right? It's not, you're not trying to push 90 and be like, oh, I'm going to, you know, now output, you know, 350 because that's where my carbohydrate for 90 grams would be. But right. that's, again, is where things get – because there's going to be a point where if I go to 290 or I go to 310 or I go to 320, that number of carbohydrates is going to get incrementally much bigger. Yeah, yeah. So that completely changes. And also, I mean, it's again, I can't work that percentage for that length of time. So again, it's just not to me the work to get to that higher level of output would be different types of training, different length of time to get to that point. So I just settle into the amount of carbohydrates that I take in and yep. get comfortable at the wattage and put that out. Yeah, no. And I think, I, I think that's a, I like that approach. It's like, okay, we'll figure out something that feels good for the, the effort that you are going to be putting in on race day. And you know, like if, if it works, you know, what, what, what becomes practical or what is practical becomes optimal in that case. Right. You know, it's like, you don't, you don't need to chase the higher and higher. And, uh, you know, I, I talked about that study, essentially what your body does and what your body is really good at is, uh, prioritizing oxidation of the substrates that are being consumed. So if you eat a lot of fat, you're going to, con- you're going to oxidize a lot of fat. If you eat a lot of carbohydrate, you're going to oxidize a lot of carbohydrate where this can become an issue, especially during long races, is if you have an individual who, is, who eats a lot of carbohydrates all the time, and they're prime and they're, you know, like in at uh, their race pace, they're burning 200 grams of carbohydrate, for example, but they're only able to intake 90 grams of carbohydrate, that's 110 gram per hour carbohydrate deficit, they are going to run out of carbohydrates way faster than somebody like Aaron, who (laughs) is burning 50 grams of carbohydrates, but able to intake 60 grams and actually maintain, um, you know, muscle glycogen and other things like that to, uh, to a, to a better extent. So again, I want to highlight that this is really, really important for longer distances and longer races, because if you run out of muscle glycogen, liver glycogen, you're, you're headed down a, a long, a, a, a bad path, right? You know, that's kind of where like the quote unquote bonk in a marathon is going to occur and other things like that. It could also be just cause you overexerted yourself for, you know, your, your fitness level and, and other things like that. But I think it does come down to carbohydrate, um, or just nutritional status in general. So, uh, so I, I think I had, I, this is a really good, this is an eye opening conversation here. And thank you for, thank you for sharing all of this. I think, um, my big takeaway is like, you don't have to chase higher and higher and higher carbohydrate intake, find something that works for you and then work within those parameters in terms of your exercise intensity output. And also you're going to spend less on, I mean, that ultimately most of what is printed from is from nutritional companies trying to sell more product. Yeah. You're going to keep a little bit of coin more in your pocket. Yeah. You can, you can, uh, you can buy extra components for your bike or, you know, other up- upgrades and stuff like that. As a continue to... to get those shoes that we talked about a couple yeah. of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I, I only have, uh, you know, seven pairs of running shoes right now, but you could have 
20. 20. <laughs> that's really that's really what it is, Aaron. You're working with big shoe companies over here, and you're trying to take down big carbohydrate just so you can get more shoes. That's what it comes down to. <laughs> yeah, I'll let that cat out of the bag, I guess. <laughs> What's well, funny though is Aaron. I I think Aaron has probably like the widest variety of like shoe types, uh, shoe brands or anything like that that I've ever seen. So he doesn't. He's not even like locked into like one you know shoe manufacturer either. So, oh man, funny, cool. Well, this is this is a really cool conversation. If you guys have any questions about you know nutrition on race day or anything like that, please let us know. Um, Oh, one thing I will reiterate is that, you know, generally speaking, you can take a little bit more carbohydrate on the bike than you can on the run. Uh, I, I imagine that you do some level of testing to see the tolerance levels of carbohydrate on the run as well as the bike and during a brick session or something like that too. Yeah, but again, the reason why I go to a lower amount of carbohydrate is just because there's more movement of the body. Yeah. So yeah. There, there's more kind of you're taking in water, you're doing other things and it's just, it's getting bounced around a lot more than when you're on that, that setup on the bike. It's just very smooth. There's not a whole lot of jarring going on. So that's, I try to decrease that amount. And also, you know, you don't really want to hit the marathon or half marathon holding 25 gels in your pocket or whatever <laughs> some people might need. And that will weigh you down. Yeah, you need a you need a bat you need a rucksack just to get your gels, you know, for the for the entire marathon. <laughs> oh no, too fu too funny. Um, good good conversation today, man. Um, if you guys do have questions, like I said, reach out to me on Instagram, Critical O Two. You can find Aaron at, at, on Instagram as well. Try a geyser. Um, you can also, if you're interested in learning more about kind of uh, right fuel, right time sort of stuff, go to Endure IQ on Instagram. And they also have a website as well um, with a lot of like free information from blog posts that Dan Plews has written um, as well as courses and other things like that. So go check them out. Um, and if you guys are on YouTube, leave a comment down below. If you have any questions about nutrition, um, if you're on Spotify, go ahead and leave us a five-star review if you're enjoying the podcast and all of that. And uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode and we'll catch you in the next one.